Hi, welcome to Enchiridion. I am honored to share with you these facts on the legendary Titanoboa. Throughout history, humans have always feared giant snakes, which symbolize death, evil, and destruction. From the famous snake in the Garden of Eden, to Jormungandr, the Viking sea serpent, to the Leviathan from the Book of Job, massive snakes have formed a staple part of feared historical creatures, producing feelings of dread, fright, horror, and terror. Titanoboa was a very large snake that lived in what is now La Guajira in northeastern Colombia. They could grow up to 42 feet or 12.8 meters long and reach a weight of 2,500 pounds or 1,135 kilograms. Fossils of Titanoboa have been found in the Cerrejón Formation and they to around 58 to 60 million years ago. This giant snake lived during the middle to late Paleocene epoch, a 10 million year period immediately following the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event. The only known species is Titanoboa sarahonensis, the largest snake ever discovered, which surpassed the previous record holder, Gigantophis. In 2009, the fossils of 28 individuals of Titanoboa sarahonensis were found in the Cerrejón formation of the coal mines of Cerrejón in La Guajira, Colombia. Prior to this discovery, Few fossils of Paleocene epoch vertebrates had been found in ancient tropical environments of South America. The snake was discovered on an expedition by a team of international scientists led by Jonathan Block, a University of Florida vertebrate paleontologist, and Carlos Jaramillo, a paleobotanist from the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. Titanoboa inhabited the first recorded tropical forest in South America. It shared its ecosystem with large crocodile moths and turtles. The paleogeography of the late Paleocene was a sheltered paralic or coastal swamp area, sheltered by the emerging later Guajira Hills in the west, and the slowly rising present-day Serrania del Perija in the east, with an open connection to the Proto-Caribbean in the north. In this environment, the tropical aquatic ferns of the genus Salvinia flourished, as evidenced by fossils found in Cerrejón, the Bogotá Formation, and the Palermo Formation. When first described in 2009, Titanoboa was estimated to have been 42 feet or 12.8 meters long. This meant that in terms of length, Titanoboa was larger than the previous record holder for the largest ever snake, Gigantophis, by a significant margin. Later modeling shown as part of the Smithsonian documentary Titanoboa Monster Snake suggested a total length of about 47.9 feet or 14.6 meters, a figure that has since been commonly rounded off to 49.2 feet, or 15 meters, by others. Reptiles are typically believed to grow in accordance with the available ambient temperature of a climate. This is the case because higher temperatures that remain fairly constant throughout the year, with very little seasonal variation, allow ectothermic or cold-blooded animals to maintain an optimum metabolism for longer periods of time. The size of Titanoboa serahonensis has also provided clues as to the Earth's climate during its existence, largely because snakes are ectothermic or relying on environmental heat sources. This means the bodily functions like respiration, digestion, and circulation, among others, all become drastically more efficient and a greater amount of energy can be set aside for other areas like growth. In reference to the larger size of Titanoboa, this could suggest that 60 million years ago, global temperatures, specifically at the equator, yet quite possibly further away, were considerably higher than those we know today. The discovery implies that the tropics, the creature's habitat, must have been warmer than previously thought, averaging about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or 32 degrees Celsius. This is the case, because today, the largest known snakes which live close to the equator can commonly attain sizes of 16.4 to 19.7 feet, or 5 to 6 meters in length, with rare individuals approaching 21.3 to 23 feet, or 6.5 to 7 meters in length. In other words, the warmer climate of the Earth during the time of Titanoboa sarahonensis allowed cold-blooded snakes to attain much larger sizes than modern snakes. Nowadays, larger ectothermic animals are found in the tropics, where it is hottest, and smaller ones are found farther from the equator. Other researchers disagree with the previously mentioned climate estimate. For instance, a 2009 study in the journal Nature applying the mathematical model used in the aforementioned study to an ancient lizard fossil from temperate Australia predicts that lizards currently living in tropical areas should be capable of reaching 33 to 46 feet, or 10 to 14 meters in length, which is not the case. 
In another critique published in the same journal, Mark Denny, a specialist in biomechanics, noted that the snake was so large and was producing so much metabolic heat that the ambient temperature must have been 4 to 6 degrees cooler than the current estimate, or the snake would have overheated. Titanoboa is usually credited as being around 42.7 to 49.2 feet, or 13 to 15 meters long, though it must be considered that as a genus, very little fossil remains of Titanoboa are currently known. It isn't inconceivable that Titanoboa may have possibly been even larger, yet we must be cautious because reconstructions should always be based upon existing fossil material. In comparison to modern snakes that are alive today, the largest snake by body weight is the green anaconda, which is credited as attaining a length of just over 21.3 feet, or 6.5 meters. Nonetheless, the largest snake by body length is the reticulated python, which is credited as approaching 23 feet or 7 meters in length for the largest individuals. On an additional note, the green anaconda and reticulated python are both commonly cited as being larger than these figures, but by how much can vary greatly by source, with 10 different sources giving you 10 different estimates. There have also been many eyewitness accounts, especially dating back to the 18th and 19th centuries, of far larger anacondas and pythons that would have been even bigger than titanoboa. Nonetheless, there is no proof of these monster snakes, and even many modern estimates have since been proven to be invalid. A problem is that most large snakes reported as signs are usually dead, and when being preserved, snake skin can stretch by a surprising degree, with the skin from a 16.4 feet or 5 meter long snake feasibly being capable of being stretched out at 24.6 feet or 7.5 meters in length, giving the false impression to later viewers that a snake was half as big than it actually was. This is why only measurements of live snakes taken by those who are experienced in handling and measuring snakes are paid any attention by the scientific community. Prior to moving on to the next section, I want to clarify Titanoboa's size by gender. There is an observable pattern among snakes in that females usually grow larger than males. Although the remains of Titanoboa are still too few to conclusively illustrate a difference between male and female Titanoboa, it would actually be unusual if female Titanoboa were not larger than males. Titanoboa fossils are so far only known from the Cerrejón Formation of Colombia in South America. The Cerrejón Formation represents what is currently the earliest known occurrence of neotropical rainforest or rainforest of Central and South America. The area of the Cerrejón Formation that the Titanoboa holotype fossils are known from has been established as going back to the Salandian of the Paleocene. This means that Titanoboa are known to have lived about 60 million years ago, give or take a few million years, and approximately 5 million years after the KT extinction, which marks the end of the Mesozoic and the disappearance of the dinosaurs. During this time, Titanoboa would have lived and hunted in low-lying rainforests that had an extensive system of rivers that crisscrossed over the landscape. Snakes are typically what you would term generalists, that will tend to eat whatever they can catch. This is especially true for constrictors that don't rely upon venom to subdue prey, and therefore have no reliance upon working venom, which may have different effects on different types of creatures or prey. Anyhow, by constricting, the method of killing is asphyxiation, from the prey having its lungs squeezed by the muscular coils of a snake, such that the lungs can expand to take in fresh oxygenated air. Whereas constrictors don't have fangs for injecting venom, they still have rows of teeth that grow in rows within the upper and lower jaws. These teeth are typically very thin, yet pointed sharp like needles, and are adapted for puncturing soft tissues and holding prey in place. A specific adaptation to this purpose is that these teeth are usually strongly recurved. This means that the teeth bend like curved hooks so that the points of the teeth actually project to the rear of the mouth and the opening of the throat. Due to the shape, when these teeth hook into the flesh of a prey animal, there is no way for that animal to pull itself free. For instance, to be constricted like an anaconda or python, ever latch onto something like your hand, the worst thing you can do is immediately try to pull it out because you would only drive the snake's teeth deeper into your own flesh. Instead, you would first have to push your hand deeper into the snake's mouth, and then open the jaws before you were able to pull your hand free. Though only partial skull and jawbones have been discovered, Titanoboa would still be expected to have had rows of recurved teeth within the mouth. In the first instance, the teeth would have been used to dig into the flesh of a prey animal, in turn, this would enable the head to gain a secure hold onto the prey so that no matter how hard the prey struggled, 
there was no way for the prey to pull itself free by brute force. With a secure hold, the Titanoboa could then coil its massive body around the body of the prey and simply squeeze. With a body made mostly of muscle, even a moderately sized Titanoboa would have been capable of inflicting severe pressures against the body and most importantly the lungs of its prey, with very little effort on its own part. Making an actual kill could actually have only taken a matter of minutes for a Titanoboa, yet the actual eating of the prey would have been considerably longer. The known skull and jaw remains of Titanoboa show that it would have had a similar head construction to other constrictor snakes like anacondas, meaning that the lower jaws would have extended past the back of the skull to allow for an even greater range of movement for opening the mouth. In addition to that, the lower jaws would have not only been unfused at the front, they were also capable of independent movement to one another, meaning that not only could the lower jaws come apart for an even greater opening, but that the snake could have moved up one jaw, then the other, in a fashion that would allow the mouth to sort of walk over the body of its prey. Again, the recurved teeth would have been a great benefit, because one side could anchor the head in position, while the other part moved along, and vice versa. Once the body of the prey was within the stomach of the Titanoboa, stomach acids would have dissolved all parts of the animal, from soft flesh to hard bone. How long it takes to digest an animal will of course depend upon the size of the prey, with bigger animals that have more mass taking longer, simply because there is just more to dissolve. Metabolism is also a factor, and the closer a snake comes to its optimum temperature, the more efficient the digestion process. In terms of actual hunting behavior, the sheer size of a large Titanoboa would mean that it would have been incapable of moving through the tree canopy like numerous smaller forms, and so Titanoboa probably spend their time slithering around trees as opposed to trying to climb them. The large size of a Titanoboa body, particularly the associated weight, would also mean that a Titanoboa would have been physically cumbersome when moving over the land. Nonetheless, when lurking within the undergrowth, a Titanoboa would have still been capable of initiating a lightning fast ambush strike at a passing prey animal while hidden within the undergrowth. Titanoboa would have been at their most dangerous when in the water. When in the water, body weight means very little because the buoyancy of the water would counteract the effects of gravity upon the body, which is also the same reason why marine animals like whales grow to such massive sizes. This would mean that even a large Titanoboa would have been very quick when moving through the water, as well as expending comparatively little energy to do so than what it would have had to do if on land. Another advantage of hunting in the water is that the sheer bulk of the body of Titanoboa would have been hidden by the water. When striking animals that were on or near the surface, the surface sheen of the water would have hidden any approach from a Titanoboa submerged under the surface, while the Titanoboa would have been able to lock onto the silhouette of its targeted prey. Additionally, Titanoboa would have been capable of lurking upon the bottom of a body of water and holding its breath for a considerable amount of time, waiting for other animals swimming through the water, which it could then strike at from below. Snakes are typically generalists, even species which may display a preference for certain types of animals, through specific patterns of hunting behavior, will attempt strikes on other animals if they think they have an opportunity for a meal. In determining what Titanoboa ate, we have to look at the other known fauna of the Cerrejón formation. Some animals that immediately stand out are crocodiles, specifically the genera Cerrejonisuchus, Acheronisuchus, and Anthracosuchus. Although crocodiles are fearsome predators in their own right, it is a known scientific fact that they can become prey to large snakes that won't think nothing of attacking and consuming them. This behavior has been independently witnessed, photographed, and recorded in modern snakes like anacondas, and by extension, it seems perfectly plausible that a snake like Titanoboa, known to be much bigger than modern snakes, could have been attacking and eating crocodiles, some of which were comparable in size to modern forms. Prehistoric crocodiles and giant snakes were not the only reptiles present in the Cerrejón formation. Large freshwater turtles, much bigger than those we know today, were also living there during the Paleocene. These genera include Carbonemus and Puentenemus, and both of these turtles are known to have grown so large that it is perhaps highly unlikely that even a Titanoboa could have swallowed them whole. This might in fact be part of the reason why these turtles grew such large shells in the first place. With them being so big, they may have effectively taken themselves off the menu. It could be argued that a large Titanoboa could have crushed the turtle shell with its coils and broken it up, yet this would have taken substantially more effort than just squeezing air out of the lungs, 
And while snakes are capable of digesting bone in shell, it takes far longer to digest than more fleshy prey like crocodiles. Thus, while it may have been possible for Titanoboa to hunt turtles, particularly small juveniles, they may have had a preference towards easier prey. While initially thought to have been an apex predator of the Paleocene ecosystem in which it lived, analysis of the cranial elements of Titanoboa has revealed that it had unique features relative to other voids or boas. These features include high palatal and marginal tooth position counts, low angled quadrate orientation, and reduced palatine pterygoid and teri. This is pointed to the genus being dominantly pisciparous or a fish eater, a trait unique to Titanoboa among all boids or boas. Thus, a third prospect for Titanoboa prey that still takes people by surprise is large fish. Fish are known to be eaten by snakes, including constrictors like anacondas, and the remains of particularly large lungfish that may have grown to as much as 9.8 feet or 3 meters long are known from the Cerrejon Formation. A Titanoboa would have certainly been capable of striking at a large fish, yet killing a lungfish may have been a challenge. As long as water passes over the gills, you can't drown a fish like you could a crocodile, and you can't suffocate a lungfish just by removing it from the water. What makes a lungfish a lungfish is its ability to breathe out of water. A titanoboa could have still killed a lungfish by constriction, such as by closing gill openings under the water, or may have begun swallowing the fish while still alive, and then relied upon that process to asphyxiate the fish. A titanoboa may have been able to hold onto a lungfish for some time, as long as the glottis, the opening in the lower mouth, was not obstructed, so that the titanoboa itself could still breathe. Another subject to cover includes cannibalism. Snakes in the wild are known to eat other snakes, including those of their own species, if they spot an individual that is particularly smaller than themselves. If Titanoboa were like other constrictors, then females would have been substantially larger than males, so much so that a male would have been an easy meal for a larger female. Female upon male predation has been recorded in modern anacondas. What was previously mentioned was speculation based upon the known fauna of the Cerrejon Formation. Other types of animals like birds and mammals were also probably present in the same environment, and we simply have not found any fossils for these yet. It is worth noting that not every animal gets fossilized, and in the case of the Cerrejon Formation being a working coal mine, it is almost certain that an uncomfortable number of fossils unknown to us have already been destroyed. In simple terms, no one knows for sure why Titanoboa went extinct, yet there are two main theories. The first is global temperature change. Today, we can establish a clear correlation between reptile size and ambient climate temperature. The hotter the climate, the larger reptiles seem to get. Those in temperate locations and or with a strong seasonal bearings between hot and cold seem to stay fairly small. However, as you get near the equator, average temperatures rise and seasonal variation is almost non-existent due to the simple fact that daylight exposure to the sun is at a constant. By contrast, extreme north or south latitudes experience extended or reduced daylight hours depending on how the Earth tilts on its rotation as it orbits the Sun on its yearly cycle. Because temperatures near the equator are more constant, it is easier for reptiles to exploit that ambient temperature. The ambient temperature is also near optimum for reptiles so that their metabolism is operating as it should, something which many researchers believe allows reptiles living closer to the equator to attain larger sizes because they do not have to be concerned with a high variance in local temperatures. Titanoboa being so large has been taken as an indication that the planet had a higher average global temperature during the Paleocene than previously thought. It is also thought, however, that average global temperatures were very slowly declining, something that is believed to have contributed towards a global shift from dense forests to open grasslands during later epochs going on towards the Miocene. One idea is that Titanoboa may eventually have not been able to maintain their metabolisms due to falling temperatures in their ecosystems, something which may have seen them replaced by smaller snakes that could still operate optimally in the lower temperatures. Other giant snakes like Matsoya and Gigantophus in other parts of the world are known to have been around until the mid-Eocene period, roughly some 20 million years after the disappearance of Titanoboa. The presence of these snakes later in the fossil record proves that giant snakes did not vanish overnight. Yet since the fossil evidence at the time of the creation of this video indicates that these snakes were smaller than Titanoboa, then they may actually support the theory of steadily declining global temperatures driving a shift into the dominance of smaller snake forms. The other theory that explains the extinction of Titanoboa is habitat change. 
Around 60 million years ago, the Cerrejón Formation was a low-lying coastal plain, covered with lush rainforests that had an extensive system of numerous rivers running across the landscape. In stark contrast to this ancient depiction, the Cerrejón Formation is today the largest coal mine in Colombia and is situated much higher above sea level than it was during the Paleocene. The coal of the Cerrejón Formation is essentially the fossil remains of all the plants and trees that once formed the lush rainforest that would have been present in the time of Titanoboa. This has preserved numerous fossils of plants as well as many animals, yet it also proves that the specific habitat that Titanoboa lived in is now gone. However, it is of course possible that Titanoboa may have had a wider geographic and temporal distribution than what we know about, we just don't know about the fossils yet. Titanoboa means Titanic Boa. It was named by Head in 2009. Titanoboa belonged to the kingdom Animalia, the phylum Cardata, the class Reptilia, the order Squamata, the suborder Serpentes, the family Boidae, the genus Titanoboa, and the type species Titanoboa serrejonensis. The only species within the genus is the type species Titanoboa serrejonensis. The species epithet serrejonensis refers to the Cerrejon coal mine and the Cerrejon formation in which the fossils have been found. Titanoboa was a carnivore and most probably a piscivore or fish eater as evidenced by numerous anatomical features. It was between 42 and 48.6 feet or 12.8 and 14.8 meters long. At the thickest part of the body, it was up to 3.3 feet or 1 meter wide. Nonetheless, comparisons between the sizes and shapes of its fossilized vertebrae with those of extant snakes have estimated that the largest individuals of Titanoboa serrejonensis had a total length of around 42 feet or 12.8 meters and weighed about 2,500 pounds or 1.12 long tons, 1.25 short tons, and 1,135 kilograms. Titanoboa has been discovered in the Cerrejon Formation of Colombia, South America. It lived during the Salandian of the mid-late Paleocene, 58 to 60 million years ago. Titanoboa fossils include remains of 28 individuals described so far. Following what were at the time recent and awe-inspiring discoveries, there was an explosion of Titanoboa in popular culture. On March 22, 2012, a full-scale model replica of a 48-foot or 14.6 meter long and 2,500 pound or an 1,135 kilogram Titanoboa was displayed in the Grand Central Terminal in Midtown Manhattan in New York City, New York. It was a promotion for a TV show on the Smithsonian Channel called Titanoboa Monster Snake, which aired on April 1, 2012. The life-size model is an exhibit in the Smithsonian Museum. Titanoboa was also featured in one of the episodes of Primeval New World, where it attacked a pair of scientists on a boat in Dino Dana, where one even licks Dana, and in the 2016 PBS documentary Secrets of the Dead, Graveyard of the Giant Beasts. It appears in Jurassic Park Builder as a gold creature in the Glacier Park, in the Xenozoic Park section of Jurassic World The Game, in Ark Survival Evolved with an inaccurate frill, in Jurassic World Alive, and in the Stomping Land prior to the cancellation of the game. Some prehistoric creatures grow to massive sizes, be it the mosasaurs, crocodiliforms, theropods, and of course the massive sauropods and titanosaurs. Titanoboa was no exception, the largest snake to have ever dwelled on Earth. Measuring roughly 42 feet, or 12.8 meters in length, in Colombia, South America, amongst the tropical forests, along with other large turtles and crocodilomorphs. It was most probably piscivorous, as evidenced by an array of features, and was an omen of death for anything that crossed its path or it ambushed. A massive body coiling to suffocate you slowly yet surely, and an almost assured death. You would never want to cross paths with such a beast. Although there are currently divisions as to the exact paleobiology of Titanoboa, further research may shed light on these ideas to explain such a phenomenon with greater clarity. A record holder, a heavy snake, and particularly thick, Titanoboa. Lengthy, constricting, and possibly cannibalistic. And with that, thank you for joining me in this prehistoric beast episode. This video was quite extensive and was supplemented greatly by Darren Pepper's analysis of prehistoric wildlife, 
which is a source of further information and general paleontology information I highly recommend. I've always wanted to make a documentary on Titanoboa, so it's great that I had the opportunity to do so. Titanoboa, Sarcosuchus, and Argentabus are some of my favorite prehistoric beasts, and stay tuned for more Dinosaurs on Earth episodes on prominent dinosaurs, they will be out soon. As always, thank you for watching, this is Ankyridian, see you next time.